dollars and months and months to figure out. But what happens when you and I don't get our fair share of the economic dollar? What happens to your farming operation, to your community, to your state, to the national economy? We took a study of 13 states in the Midwest. We made a study to find out what income the American farmer and rancher in those 13 states received for the commodities they sold in 1979. And we chose the year 1979 because the 1980 figures were not available at the time that we made the study. In 1979, you and I received 71% parity for the products that we sold. That means that we sold a dollar's worth of food and fiber in the marketplace and brought home 71 cents. Well, I don't want to give you a rundown state by state, district by district of each of the 13 states. I don't want to take the time now. But sometime this evening or tomorrow when we have a break, stop by the growth and maintenance booth that's out there in the hall. And if you're from one of those 13 states, let them know what state you're from. They'll have a breakdown to give to you so that you can take that home to show your banker, the businessmen on Main Street, the people in rural America, why we have the economic conditions that we have. Because in those 13 states alone, you received $62 billion for the commodities you sold at 71% of a fair price. And had you received a full fair price, you should have received about $85 billion, $87 billion, which meant that you were shortchanged $25 billion in one year, in 1979, in the marketplace that we failed to extract for the products we sold. We have those figures. They're on paper. Take them with you and don't be afraid to use them. It's time we let the people of this country know why we are in the economic troubles that we're in. Now, I want you to bear with me just for a few minutes, because I'm going to give you some numbers that are important. Listen closely. If you've got a pencil and paper, write them down. In 1979, the American farmer and rancher received $136 billion nationwide. Now, we didn't take a study of all the states. We only got 13 of them. But nationwide, the total, you and I received $136 billion at 71% of parity, 71% of a fair price. Had we received a full fair price, full value, we should have brought home from the marketplace $200 billion or $64 billion more than we actually did. We didn't do it. What does that $64 billion amount to? And keep in mind, this is just in one year. How much is that in 10 years? That's over a half a trillion dollars, isn't it? Lost for the wealth that you and I produced. Well, that $64 billion in 1979 was largely our net income. And just 25% income tax paid on net income, figure it out. It's $20 billion that was never generated for our local, state, and national public treasuries. That's $200 billion in 10 years. That's a short span in the economic cycle. That would have still left $44 billion to spend of earned money on Main Street to buy the goods and services that you and I needed. It would have generated tax from sales. It would have given profits to merchants to pay income tax on. That was never generated. And we have economists and politicians who are scratching their heads and debating what shall we do to straighten out our economic conditions.
You know, I'm still hearing that if we raise farm prices to a full, fair value, it's going to cause inflation. How many of you have heard that? Well, I submit to those that say that fair farm prices will cause inflation, that if fair farm prices cause inflation, we should have had no inflation since 1953. All of the inflation this country should have had should have been prior to 1953 because that's when we were getting a full fair share of, our economic, of the economic dollar. It's only because since 1953 when farm prices began to fall, inflation began to heat up. Why? Well, I don't think anybody would deny, whether it be an economist, politician, a layperson, or whoever, that inflation comes from borrowing money, spending the borrowed money, and not having the ability to repay it. You know, if I borrowed $1,000 to buy an item, and I didn't have the money to pay it back, but I borrowed it, it means that I never spent one minute's labor to earn that $1,000. I never sold one nickel's worth of item to earn that $1,000. I merely borrowed it and put it out in the economy, I spent it, it's out there, and somebody's going to get it. It doesn't just hang on a tree somewhere or fall on the ground, it's out there circulating and somebody has got to get it. Now we've got three major segments in our economy. We have labor, industry, and agriculture. And if all three segments had the equal ability to get their share of that dollars that I borrowed and spent, I'd have the ability to earn enough money to repay that debt, and we'd be in good shape. But that's not the case. The facts are that agriculture, or I mean labor, has the ability to contract with management to increase their wage level to earn their share of that extra thousand dollars I threw out there. Industry has the ability to extract their share of that thousand dollars by raising their prices on the commodities that they sell. We in agriculture are not that fortunate at this point and don't have the ability to extract our share. We are still saying, what do you give me? And we're taking less than a full fair price. So what does this mean? It means that we've got to pay higher labor costs, higher industrial costs, justified, because the money is out there, it's got to be gotten by somebody. But then how do we do it? We borrow some more money next year to pay for those higher costs and throw that money out there and not having the ability to repay, you've got another round of inflation. In 1955, agriculture had a $12 billion debt. In 1975, it had a $91 billion debt. In 1981, we're $186 billion in debt in agriculture alone. And I'll challenge any economist and any politician that says that fair farm prices cause inflation. I'll challenge them in public or private to explain to me how that happens. And I hope I get some takers. We have in this country the opportunity now to be able to bring forth out of this convention policies and ideas and thoughts and direction to gel the people of this country behind a solid agricultural program. Because we're looked upon as an organization that has something that no other organization has ever had, 
and that is the ability to do for ourselves what no one else can possibly do for us. I ask you this, is the objectives that we have, are they honorable? You bet they are. Because we have what every other person who is trying to understand why we're in the economic conditions today. We've got the answer, and we have the ability and the means to do it. Well, is the objective that we have reasonable? Some say that what we're after is far too much. It's impossible. It can't happen. We're going to hurt some other segment of the economy if we achieve our goals. I was just asked this morning, what's going to happen to the food prices? What's going to happen to the poor consumer when you achieve what you're after? Folks, we're asking for contracts that will return to us cost of production plus a reasonable profit. We're asking for contracts with the industry that will establish fair prices over a long period of time. And I'll submit that when farm prices go up for three months and then drop back down, it does nothing but cause chaos. Because the old marketing system causes price fluctuations at the, pro at the, at the producer level and does not give the consumer the ability to budget their money for food like it can for other items. Almost every item the consumer buys can be budgeted for. And during this day when most consumers need to budget the income that they receive, they still cannot budget what they can spend for food because they don't know what food is going to cost next week, next month, or in six months from now. They're guessing. Our objective is to stabilize the price at the producer level at a full fair price, stabilize the entire food industry so that the consumer can budget and know what food is going to cost her, him or her next week, next month, six months from now. Our objective is to extract from the marketplace a full dollar for a dollar's worth of commodity sold so that we can pay our bills and retire debt spend and distribute earned money, create the dollars needed to pay for public services, reduce the need for borrowed money, which will reduce the interest rates, align agriculture with labor and industry, and earning power so that we can curb inflation and bring a healthy gross national product to this country. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the objective of this organization. In the end, that's what's going to happen. Is our objective reasonable? You bet it is. Not only do we have the right as leaders in the farm and ranch communities, but we have the responsibility to see to it that these objectives are carried through. Because you and I control that force of production. You and I have the means and the ability to carry through with moving that production in a direction that will extract the money that is needed in our farming operations to be distributed throughout the entire nation to bring sanity back to our nation's system. There are still skeptics who say that $4.50 corn is not achievable, or $12 soybeans, or $7 wheat, or $80 hogs. I've heard that, too. Well, I want to ask these skeptics this. I wonder if they can remember just three or four years ago when they used to pay 30 cents a gallon for gas. It wasn't very long ago. I wonder if they thought that gas would ever be at $1.30 by 1981, just a few years later. I don't think a one of us dreamed that that could happen. How about that car that they bought for $3,000 just a few years ago? They probably are still driving it. 
that in 1981 they're going to have to pay $9,000 for a car half the size. I don't think there's a one of those skeptics that would ever have dreamed that could have ever happened. How about the 50 horsepower tractor that's increased in price 600% these last five years? 600%. And here's one for you. How long ago was it since you paid 6% interest? It wasn't too long ago. I still got a note with 6% interest. I'm glad I did then. How many of those skeptics would have ever believed that interest would be at 20% in 1981? Not one of them. Well, I say to those skeptics that the prices that we're asking and after are achievable not only achievable, but they're going to be obtainable through nationwide collective bargaining and the programs that we have, and the ones that you're going to take a look at tomorrow. Because it will only bring us in line with the rest of the economy. And ladies and gentlemen, we can accept nothing less than that. You know, a meaningful organization must give leadership and direction. But no organization, whether it be a farm organization, whether it be a, an organization in any segment of this country, should do for its members and its people what they can do for themselves. And tomorrow when you visit with the commodity departments, Sit in on them and listen well. Learn from them. Glean what you can. Because in those commodity departments and in those programs that you're going to learn from, you're going to learn how you can do for yourselves what no organization, no politician, no other organization can possibly do for you. Those programs are for you to take back home, to give the leadership in your counties, to develop and do for yourselves what this organization wants you to do. And when you get home, you're going to teach others on how to do for themselves along with you. And those of you that accept the role of leadership when you get back home are going to have the pride of knowing that as the prosperity begins to develop in your rural areas, that you were part of it and that you caused it to happen. You're seen by the farmers and ranchers in this country as the key leaders of this organization. Something else I want to say before I close, and that is we know where we're at and where we're going and how to get there. We know how to carry it through because those programs you're going to take a look at tomorrow is going to give you the ability to know how. But there's one thing we haven't addressed ourselves to, I don't think, and I don't think we probably have taken it serious. And that is this, that as we grow as an organization and gain more influence in the economy and in the marketing system, there are going to be those who want to see our gains negated and destroyed. And we, when, when we get to a certain level, it's going to be tough to do economically because we're going to carry ourselves as an industry but let us never forget that this nation has a legislative process that's been used against powerful groups and people. And if those groups aren't watching what's happening in that legislative process, a lot of gains that we've made could be destroyed with a stroke of a pen. I'm telling it to you straight. We know this. 
as long as we are not stepping on heavy toes. We'll be left alone. But we don't intend to be, want to be left alone because we're going to step on some heavy toes and we're going to make some tremendous gains. So tomorrow, after you've sit through your commodity meetings, after you've gleaned what you could to learn, to take back home, how to do for yourself, I ask that every one of you go to a, the legislative meeting that's going to be held tomorrow evening. I think it's 6 o'clock. Chuck Fraser and his group. I want you to learn from that how to protect the right to do for yourselves. Because that's where it's at. We've got a legislative representative in Washington, a watchdog, that has got to be there to protect our right to do for ourselves what others want to do to us. The Capra-Volstead Act is our lifeline. Those who want to see us gone are saying that the federal, pro the federal government should develop collective bargaining and supervise it from that level. And if we don't watch that type of action in legislation, it's going to throw stones and stumbling blocks in front of us as fast as we can climb over them. And I ask you, don't neglect that end of it. We have a democracy. We've got a political democracy. And whether we like it or not, we've got to Work with it, protect yourselves from it, if nothing else. It's part of growing in the largest agricultural industry in the world. Well, when you get home, you're going to take the role of leadership. And when you get home, you're going to hear political speeches and you're going to hear excuses from those people why farm commodity prices are so low. Listen to them. Hear them out. And folks, if they're on the wrong track, get a piece of their hide. It's coming up next year. In closing, I want to say this. October 1981, the parity ratio, the parity level fell to 51 percent, a record low. And I submit to those who enjoy that parity level for farmers and ranchers, and those who are profiting by it, they'd better enjoy it, because together we're going to change that. Thank you.